Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, MJ. Welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is one of the world's foremost authorities on Burgundy and a member of the famed Wasserman clan, Paul B. Wasserman. Uh, Paul is joining us from France today. This is a very special episode of the Black Wine Guy Experience. It's our first remote guest here on the Black Wine Guy, and shit, uh, you know, it's well worth it to have a Burgundy expert in Burgundy <laughs> on the show. So um, let me tell you a bit about Paul. Paul was just a year old when the Wassermans moved from Philadelphia to Burgundy. From his late teens on, Paul worked for his mother, Becky, the celebrated Burgundy exporter. He moved to Los Angeles in 1994, where, because Burgundy was frowned upon at the time, he worked as a sales rep and was eventually hired as the French, German, and Austrian wine buyer for the Woodland Hills Wine Company, where he became known as one of the, the country's foremost specialists in French and German wines. He also wrote about wine for the Rob Report, Worth, and had a column in the now-defunct Statement magazine. Paul returned to the family business in 2012, he manages sales for Becky Wasserman and Co. for the West Coast and Mountain States and scouts for additional producers to add to the company's already incredible portfolio of winemakers. Welcome, Paul. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, that uh, sounds like my life. <laughs> all right. Good job. Good job, producer. Um, all right, Paul. So um, <clears throat> I want to... Um, Warm us up. This is a tradition here. Uh, I want to ask you some personal questions, followed by uh, James Lipton's famous 10 questions from inside the actor's studio, which uh, appropriately are by Proust, as you are in France. So the key is just answer them quickly. Uh, this is just to warm us up. Whatever comes top of mind. All right, so are you ready? Yeah. Okay. What is your favorite book? Well, it changes all the time. Right now, it's um, a book of short stories by Lydia Davis. Okay, okay. Love it. What is your favorite movie? Ooh. Ooh. That is... I don't know. I'm going to have to pass. They go in, they go out. Um, I'll, let's get back to that one. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll come back to that. <clears throat> We're going to reserve the right to ask that, to recall that question. Um, who is your favorite musical artist? It would be a number of jazz people um, from the bebop era, Coltrane, Parker, Miles Davis, all of that. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, you know, I got some feedback on this next question, so I'm going to change it. So uh, what is uh, Death Row? What's your last meal? What would you want to eat? I would want to eat a great sushi meal. Mm. What would you pair with that sushi meal? I would have red burgundy. I think I'm going to do that tonight. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Who is your favorite athlete? I'm not a big sports guy, but because I just watched the – Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. I'm just going to say Michael Jordan. All right. Inspirational All right. figure. Gotcha. 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 Who was your favorite cartoon character as a child? My favorite cartoon character as a child was um, probably Wiley e. Coyote. Genius. <laughs> Wiley E. Coyote. Genius. Yeah. <laughs> I liked him too. Um, he even had the business card that said genius on it. It was, it was, it was awesome. Mm. Um, <clears throat> now this could be tough cause you, you, you moved to Burgundy when you were so young, but, uh, what was your favorite cereal? Did, did they have, do they have cold? Well, I'm sure they have cold cereal. They, they, they did. And again, you know, growing up in France, I wasn't a big cereal guy. Um, I did have, um, a very brief stint with honey smacks. Okay. Dig them. <clears throat> dig them um what is your current exercise routine i have um a machine i don't know what it's called but it's one of these things and um it's pretty recent for me to exercise i've been pretty skinny and fit all my life but 
now that I'm moving on in age, I need to do a little more. That and walking. All right, nice. nice. I feel you on moving on in age. Ugh, it's, the, it's the best, it's the worst. Um, yep. Next question. Who is your favorite comedian? Comedian, comedian, um, comedian. I love Bill Maher. I'm kind of religious about getting my political news from him. That's a good one. That's that's the first time we got Maher. That is a good one. He is a funny guy. Um, <clears throat> who would you most like to have a bottle of wine with? Um, Prince. Nice. 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 Okay, so now I, I, I uh, do my impersonation of James Lipton just for this part, and we're going to get into uh, the uh, Proust questionnaire. So what is your favorite word? My favorite word is... My favorite word is... Um, oh, jeez. I have to pick one favorite word. Um, elegance. It took it took a second, mm -hmm. but that is a very good one. <laughs> um, what is your least favorite word? Cruelty. Mm. Mm. Uh, what turns you on? Mm -hmm. um, love, friends, good times with people. Awesome. Uh, what turns you off? Um, it's going to be along the same themes. Meanness. Got it. Um, what sound or noise do you love? I love more than anything else the sound of the bass guitar. Hmm. Hmm. Nice. Um, what sound or noise do you hate? Uh, nails on the chalkboard. <laughs> Classic. You can't go wrong. Classic. Can't go wrong with hating not, that one. <laughs> not original, but but it it is one of the most grating sounds ever, um, or noises. Okay, let's have some fun. What is your favorite curse word? And it can be French, like we had someone who was in Portuguese. What is your favorite curse word? My favorite curse word. Oh. Hmm. I don't know. I should have prepared for this, but I didn't. My favorite curse word, I'm just going to say shucks. <laughs> We're going to have so much fun with that. <laughs> I got to be honest, man. <laughs> I think at least, at least, <laughs> Jordan's, hey, at least Jordan's was a curse word. I mean, albeit it, it was damn. <laughs> she said, we don't use well, damn I, enough. You know. <laughs> I, I feel you though, man. I feel you. Like, shucks was what I used to say until I was eight. Cause, but I shucks is what I was used to say at home. <laughs> so we know we know where you're going with that one. Um, exactly. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I would like to, if I'd done something else, I would have liked to be a journalist. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, what profession would you not like to do? I would not like to sell cars. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for like six weeks. You're, you're very right. It's not a good gig. No. Yeah, it's not a good gig. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I would be very reassured if everything he said was about tolerance. Mm. Wow. Awesome. Well, listen, Paul, thank you. That was fun. And if you guys want more Paul, and I know you do, you're going to tune into our episode of the Black Wine Guy Experience. Until then, cheers. Cheers. All right. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, MJ, and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is one of the world's foremost authorities on Burgundy 
and a member of the famed Wasserman family, Paul B. Wasserman. Uh, Paul is joining us from Burgundy, France today. This is our first remote guest here on the Black Wine Guy Experience, and we feel it's well worth it. Paul was just a wee lad of a year old when the Wassermans moved from Philly, that's Philadelphia, to all our friends tuning in in Burgundy because Paul's on, uh, to Burgundy. Uh, from his late teens on, Paul worked for his mother, Becky. She is the uh, celebrated Burgundy uh, exporter, importer into the United States. Uh, he moved to Los Angeles in 1994, where um, Burgundy was kind of frowned upon at the time. So he worked as a sales rep and was eventually hired as the French, German, and Austrian wine buyer for the Woodland Hills Wine Company, where he became known as one of the country's foremost specialists in French and German wines. He also wrote about wine for the Rob Report, Worth, and had a column in the now-defunct Statement magazine. Paul returned to the family business in 2012. He manages sales for Becky Washman & Co. for the West Coast and the Mountain States, and he scouts for additions to the company's incredible portfolio of family of wineries. Welcome, Paul. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No. You oh. you said it all. <laughs> well, I said what my producer found on you, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, tell us about the wines uh, we're drinking today. So I have the white in my glass. Tell us about the wines. Okay, so the white is unexpected in the sense that um, a lot of people who like Burgundy, who like northern, sort of northern northern French wines, frown on the southern. French wines because we think of them as fat, oaky, rich in alcohol. And uh, two or three years ago, I went down to the Roussillon, you know, expecting to taste really great reds, and I was floored by the whites. I had no clue that they were like this at all. They have very low pHs, three-ish, which is like, you know, Chenin Blanc from Saumur. The alcohols are super low, they're super fresh, and they're way more reminiscent of northern whites. They uh, they're 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 delicate. They're fresh. They're energetic, and I've we we work with two domains uh, down there: Danjou Bancy, which you're having, and and Roque des Anges. And their whites are just absolutely beautiful. And it was a big surprise for me. And it's always exciting to discover something. Um, you know, we're always pretentious in the wine trade, saying we've discovered this. Of course, it existed. I just didn't know about it. Right. We're all like Christopher Columbus. Look what I discovered. No, bitch, you walked into the domain. It would have been making a precision. You're just <laughs> lucky nobody saw it before you among your competitors. But that's about the extent of the discovery you do. Um, but they're 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 so surprising, and I love them to pieces. This is Macabre, a classic okay. Southern grape. Um, from a wonderful um, family. They're two brothers. They're very young. One is actually the spinning image of David Schwimmer. And it's hard not to think you're drinking with David Schwimmer uh, <laughs> when you're... And he's also a brilliant blind taster. So, but it's very odd. He's like the twin brother of David Schwimmer. And they're amazing. They're brilliant farmers. They're um, very harsh conditions in the Roussillon. And they're turning out these absolutely stunning wines. I wouldn't be surprised... That with the Reds starting in the 18 and 19 vintage, they do become one of our cult mm. domains, which is not a, a given for something from the Roussillon. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I'm going to have to uh, keep my eye out for these. This is actually, it's very elegant. Um, like you said, I, I, I uh, and I, I, I'm thank you for letting me know what the grape is, but it's, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful wine. Um, and it's right. It feels crisp, right? It yeah, yeah, like yeah. It's it's fresh. It's crisp. Um, this is something that uh, it's a warm day here. Like it's perfect for like I could drink this thing like all summer long. You know, just um, paratif. But it's just freaking delicious. It probably goes really well with food too. I'd have to imagine. Yeah, everything you expect. You know, delicate crisp wines to go to uh, go with. So shellfish, uh, crudo, um, on its own at 5 p.m., you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> awesome. So um, I'm giving myself a little wash in my glass. Um, and then um, ooh, that, was ooh. A good, that was a good wash. Um, yep. And tell us about the red. 
So the red is from one of our favorite people on the planet, David Croix. It's from the Domaine des Croix, and it's a wine from Bone. The vineyard is Les Sans Vignes. Okay. And what I love about this is that four or five years ago, we would have never expected Burgundy to go down the path of, you know, the, the quaffable side of natural wine. And a bunch of people have much quicker than we thought they would. And um, so uh, there's not a ton of whole cluster. There's about 30%, but there's very, very del delicate extraction. Um, we're, there's only 10% new oak. We're reducing um, sulfur a lot, this group of young people. And, um, and so, you, you, so we're, we're, we're starting to see a very different side of Burgundy, which is not the classic collectible, you got to age me for 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is the pop and pour side of it, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, there's a young gang. Well, not, not everyone's young, but to me, that's kind of the gang that's really interesting to follow. And they're not necessarily coming from the great Appalachians. Mm -hmm. A couple of them are. Um, but they taste in a group. Um, there's a lot of emulation. Every generation has its its cool kids. Uh, it, you, once upon, you know, the prior generation, it was Lafont, it was Rumier, it was um, Rouleau was part of it. Desmet, Patrick Bees, um, that gang, and they they were the first to really taste in each other's cellars and be very harsh with the, with each other about their wines. And and this group is. David Croix, Thomas Boulet, Olivier Lamy, Charles Lachaud, Sylvain Pataille, Nicolas Rossignol, they, 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 um, they taste together, they, there's a lot of emulation, there are a lot of them working on different aspects. Um, they're pushing farming pretty far, um, looking into, um, you know, very specific things. It's, it's, it, the sound bite is no longer organic and biodynamic. You have to look at other things like plowing, like cover crafts, like, uh, crops like not um, plowing at all, like not hedging, hedging later, all of that. And um, and there we go. So we we love that group of winemakers. David is not just a brilliant winemaker, but such a nice, humble person. Um, and I think the wine is, I mean, I think people who drink natural wine would almost enjoy this. Um, yeah, I, like, so I don't know if you listen to the episode so like you say natural wine i'm like this doesn't smell like any natural wine i've had i mean i get well, you know because because it, it's a it can be it can be a generic term but man i could see we're gonna have to have you back on you you're going deep you're talking about not even plowing and hedging and not hedging i mean like we we only have so much time here but like i actually we, that's a rabbit hole that that needs to be explored i mean wow yeah, I'll just say this. If Burgundy is going to be this expensive, they need to have the greatest farming on the planet. And um, certainly the domains that, you know, we care about and our competitors care about, we're, we're talking about the, you know, 10, 15 top percent of Burgundy. But there are people looking much further right now uh, into that. And and I believe it's, it's their duty at these prices to, to just farm more and better um and think about everything and this group i have huge respect for because they're actually doing that nice nice so i love this um because i i don't know shit about burgundy you know um because it's i mean you know probably because i'm lazy um but uh <laughs> but um thank you for giving me some lessons here and uh now that i now that i got you now that i have your skype number oh buddy i got you um <laughs> gonna have to come over there and hang all right so um like i said there's so much to discuss today um but let's begin with um growing up in france being born into a uh a family whose business is wine and whose mother is like a pioneer we're in women's history month like your mother is like a a, a grand dame of the wine business what was that like it was well it didn't start out that way my mom got into uh, the wine business in 79, I was 13, uh, but once my parents moved to France, they were immediately um, into wine and food. Um, they had been before, already in Philadelphia. My mom was a great cook. They were already drinking wine, and um, when they moved here, there was just it was just wonderful for them. 
Um, their friends quickly became the Debbie Lenz from DRC, um, Jacques Sess and Ro Jacques and Rosalind Sess from Dujac, um, the Rulos, um, the De Maltes, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they happen to actually befriend very, very, very good winemakers. <laughs> yeah, to, to say to say the least. Uh, um, for I do have some listeners who are beginners, so just kind of tell people like how you would, uh, if you could describe like those those families like well at the time you know this was um 68 yep. so starting in 68 so at the time there were there were only a handful of domains that that were really producing insane wine um and and these were among the best including you know in appellations that weren't prestigious at the time which was volney the de Montes. um but um, you know, very principled people making just stunning wines. And so the cellar was pretty much full of that. And people, all the winemakers love to come to the house, chefs and also chefs. You know, it, was, it very quickly became known as a place where you ate and drank well and, and were welcome. Um, so... That's how it started. Um, I'll, I'll be somber for two seconds, and then I'll, I'll go in and out of this. But um, my father was a complicated person. He was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. So, you know, he's kind of the guy that could suck out all the joy out of a room like a Dementor or something. And my mother started the business basically to get away from him mm, mm. Um, out of necessity. Um, okay, close the door on that. So it was very idyllic in the sense that it's a beautiful region the countryside's gorgeous the old houses are gorgeous the food and wine was great but you know like every family there were some darker sides that yeah 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 are, are, are not but you know it, it is what it is and fortunately because that's how my mom started the business yeah you know i i always you know i my mother always said like you, you got to find the good in the situation. So, I mean, but I mean, who knows what would have happened? So it, it, it's, it's, I, I don't know what it's like to grow up in that household. Uh, like you said, all families have stuff. Um, but uh, the, the, the good is that uh, your mother started this business, um, you know, um, and, and, and um, what, what so it was 1979. You said she uh, actually started the business. She started the business, and um, she first sold barrels, actually, to American wineries. So Francois Frere, um, the, the now famous Cooper. Um, and um, so she, she, she sold barrels to a lot of, you know, the, the good American wineries of the time in Napa, Oregon, mostly. And um, once she was over there, people were starting to ask her, you know, do you know some Domaine bottled Burgundies? Because a lot of the wines that showed up were bottled by Negocians, who bought wines, or at the time it was more about buying wine than grapes, actually. So they'd buy wine from smaller growers, blended in their cuvées, and people were interested in Domaine bottled Burgundy. And of course she did. Um, one of our first customers was Kermit Lynch, actually. Um, and from there, it, it grew from there, basically. Um, at one point, her book was not only Burgundy. She was in partnership with a company called Herbvin, and I think she probably had a wine from every appellation in France. And the Rhone side of the book was absolutely insane. It had had all the greats. It had, you know, it had Klopp. I'm not sure it had Trolla, uh, but, you know, that that gang was in there. There were some Spanish wines, La Rioja Alta, I think wow. maybe Sicilia at the time. Wow, 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 wow. Mm, yeah, it was it was pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And uh, when that partnership ended, she focused on Burgundy and Grower Champagne. Okay, okay. And so, like, you, you're growing up there, you're seeing your mom do this, and selling barrels that's crazy that's awesome um and you mentioned uh negotiant wine so we're talking like you're talking like um jado type wines right like a jado yeah yeah, yeah. uh bouchard yeah, pair good ones. 
Pink Lugetto and Drew One, Favley and people like that. But there was, you know, there's a lot of bad Negos you know, ones too um, showing up in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure, um, for sure. So um, now you went to high school and everything in in, in Burgundy, France. Uh, I take it. No, I went to well, I went to school in the local. Well, I want to say when it's you know like uh, preschool and middle school and the local village, okay. um, from schoolhouse, then down to Bone, um, and then when I was about twelve, I I decided to go to boarding school. Okay. The going was getting rough between my mom. Both Peter and I kind of begged to go to boarding school. So we wanted we wanted to get out of Dodge, and um, so that's what we did. We so I finished high school there. Um, then went to college in Paris, but very briefly. Okay. What was, what was that? So let's back up. <laughs> what was it like to go to college in Paris? Just albeit very briefly, a young man. In, young... I, I was, I graduated from high school at 16. I was in college at 16 and I was, um, very immature. Um, Paul, I'm and, immature now. I'm 52. Man, so. I'm, I'm, I'm immature too, but at the time I was. 16 and immature. I get it. <laughs> I, I, I did. I didn't choose the right course of studies. I, I went to study economics, believing it was the economics, economics I was studying in high school, which was more the history of economics. And then it ended up being business management, which is really not my thing. So I, I, I lasted yeah, just under a year. And um, so that was the end of all the family dreams of academia because, you know, <laughs> I, I was off to a good start, but it, it came crashing down really abruptly. And then I went to work for my mom. And then at some point I went back to music school and did sort of both at the same time. Okay. So uh, 17 years old, 18 years old, you go to work for your mom. What does she have you doing? A lot of taking customers around and translating so it's basically tasting in the cellars and that started when we were teens you know as child labor my brother and i really <laughs> um, um but it was a tiny company and when she needed us i mean i started translating cellars when i was 12 or 13 which you know was fun um and because a lot of it were was for the barrel customers we um you know we were we were going to taste the drc and translating for winemakers and it was it was good it was fun yeah that's it, not you know, it's fun tasting that drc at 12 13 that that, <laughs> it's not it doesn't suck that is so glad you're here this is definitely a unique experience um so um so you're doing that so you, so you mentioned you went uh to music school yeah all right all right uh, expand I, on that how'd you end up how'd you end up from economics to music school uh, well economics was just the wrong thing i mean had i studied history or had i gone to you know uh, journalism or I, i'd probably my life would have been taken my life would have taken a very different path because i did enjoy studying um but um something as concrete as um, accounting and business management and stats. I was good in math, but I, I didn't care about accounting or things like that at the time. Um, so just wrong, wrong choice. My parents were preoccupied with their divorce at the time. They didn't really pay attention. And I sort of threw a, a dart in the dartboard and said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Basically, I had a friend that was doing that. And I was like, okay, I'll go do the same. Um, that's how I ended up in law and, school. <laughs> And then music idea. school is interesting. I, uh, I, you know, when I was 16 and starting to be a little bit of a goofball and going out with friends, um, um, the, we had a, my father was an artist and he had a studio here and he'd, he'd left. And um, so there was this space. So we decided to, to start a band and I played piano. So I had a little electrical keyboard, but I was, I really wasn't happy with it, but they, the, the two others left the drums and the bass here. And one day I, I just went over and picked up the bass and that was it to me. That was what I wanted to do. So, um, so I played the bass a lot. I went to music school. I worked part-time for my mom. Um, I'm going to live in, um, 
in Champagne with somebody who had a studio, went to London, and eventually made my way to L.A. with my bass and lots of dreams. Like <laughs> most people go to L.A. Not a, an original story. Either. No, but it, it is original because it's yours. But, but that's so... I, I like this. He's like, I, 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 I was tasting that DRC, and then... You know, and then I had, you know, I picked up a bass and then I moved to Champagne with my bass <laughs> and then to London <laughs> and then I was in L.A. Yep, pretty much. I, I was very shy. I had to kick myself to leave France and go to L.A. Again, I picked that, you know, I just went, OK, that's where I'm going. And um and so, you know, the DRC thing sounds fun, but when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, all the trivia talk bored me to death. Yeah, you know, no, I, to, I can imagine. I can imagine. We were, we were very polite. We helped mom cook and clear, you know, clear the dishes and sat, you know, at the dinner table. But we were bored, uh, you know, like there, there wasn't this detailed winemaking talk or it was... I don't know. It was a, it was different back then. I found it all very boring. I liked the tasting part. Well, but, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I mean, <laughs> no, and, and even even that, like you know, I love, you know, I like to have this show be a mix of you know of uh, some wine geekdom, but really it's just we're sharing a bottle of wine and telling stories. And and I could see, I mean, like at thirteen, like at fourteen, like I mean, first of all, DRC, yes, it was the greatest. It's the greatest domain in Burgundy, but. They weren't pulling down those type of prices. It wasn't. I could see it. Not it wasn't. It wasn't like this is like a ten thousand dollar bottle of wine. Like that. That might perk you up if you're thirteen. You know what I mean? But like back then, it was just like yeah. this is just a vernable producer of really good wine. You know, and you're like, I'm thirteen. <laughs> what am I doing but, here? Yeah. And so I show up in L.A. and nobody likes Burgundy at the time. Yeah. What was that about? Why? Why did no one like Burgundy? <laughs> Um, so I showed up in L.A. in 94 and, you know, the United States had found the the consumer or the collector rather had found its voice, Robert Parker. And, you know, to a certain extent, the wine spectator, maybe Steve Tanzer, but um, but certainly um, Parker liked a different kind of wines. He liked big wines and Burgundy was not big. And and so this it, 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 people. People didn't find it trustworthy, um, and it just it just wasn't popular. It, it it started getting popular again in in the late '90s. So, you know, five six years later, it, it really started to to get popular again. I have one funny story. Is my second job in LA? I was working in a in a store in Beverly Hills that had somewhat of a celebrity clientele, and you know they'd come in and. I wasn't really allowed to handle celebrities, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I did. Normally, I was supposed to call the owner. And, it was like, you know, like that know. scene in Caddyshack. We, we, we have a pool and a pond. A uh, pond would be better for you. Like, like you, you stay over here. <laughs> right. So yeah. if a celebrity, you know, comes in, don't, don't. But, you know. Don't engage. <laughs> they, were, they were busy, so I got to. And I always remember the, um, Donald Sutherland coming in and buying Bordeaux and and um, I asked him if he liked Burgundy, and he, and he he got actually pretty angry. He got pretty angry. He says, "No, <laughs> Burgundy makes me angry." And you know, with that deep voice yeah. of his, no. it was yeah. it was God telling me he didn't like my friends. <laughs> you know, it was. <laughs> but that was kind of the you know the thought about Burgundy at the time. He said, uh, "No, that's." <laughs> Burgundy makes me angry with that with that deep that that, that that annotation like, like he was delivering yeah. the line in a movie right yeah exactly <laughs> like the, the music came in dun 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 no <gasps> Burgundy makes me angry um so <laughs> oh my god so I want to go that is a very funny story I want to go back to um something you said just a moment ago and that the collector had found its voice and in Robert Parker. Now, now at one point I remember, wasn't he banned from Burgundy? Like they were like, don't come to Burgundy. Now he, he was really banned, um, but he was not, he was, he was persona non grata. I understand. He was. I mean, the, um, 
the only problem with Parker, uh, if I make a slight detour, is he he really had a personal beef against Burgundy. And when when um, say Bordeaux produced a, just an okay or you know mediocre vintage, he was you know he'd pick out the good wines and say okay. It's not great, but maybe you should look at that. Well, as soon as Burgundy, you know, failed in his opinions, the 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 language was actually violent, accusatory. It was a, it was a whole different, um, borderline abusive. I mean, it it was a whole different thing. So, um, he tasted wines from Favle. Now, you know, the Favles are honest. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You, you sometimes people may at that time may have found the wines a little structured, but what he said was something along the lines that what he had tasted in France is not what he had tasted in the U.S. And he hinted at you know some sort of fraud going on. And uh, Mr. Favle was a very wealthy man, and he said, uh, "Okay." So he took him to court wow. for and won. And the damages were one franc. It was really symbolic. Wow. And um, and um, Mr. Parker, yes, decided not to come back to Burgundy and hired uh, Pierre Romani to do the reviews for him. Um, there we go. Awesome. And, uh, I love the inside scoop on this stuff. Um, so so, is it safe to say? Because we've I've heard that like to have a seat at your mother's table. Like you, you mentioned early, I mean, even when they first arrived and first arrived in France, but like, like it, it's it's the stuff of legends for anyone who loves Burgundy. I, I take it Mr. Parker's never sat at that table. Oh yes, he did in oh, the wow. up to the mid eighties. Um, I mean, he he um, he didn't have much time to hang. He would he would come in and uh, taste two hundred wines and leave. Um, would line up. I, I remember liming lining a bunch of wines up for him when I was 16 or 17 and seeing him go through them at, a, at an incredible speed and saying thank you and leaving, you know? Damn, uh, damn, Bobby, I would have hung out, man. That's me, though. That's just me. Um, um, so let's, I want to, I want to stay here for a second. So like, uh, who, who's, uh, who's been at that table? Like, Obviously, you mentioned the you know the people from DRC and other play, but who's been at that? Obviously, I would say say Kermit. Kermit Lynch has dined with your family. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember sitting on Kermit's lap and at the piano. I have a vague memory. Um, um, yeah, Kermit. I mean, pretty much everybody in the wine trade and and you know some other fun people, chefs, um, politicians. Um, writers uh it's it's name names drop some names man drop some names <laughs> um nah he's like nah, uh, <laughs> nah. Um, i love how humble you are though seriously i do but, dig it but never you know i mean everybody in wine just a lot i mean not everybody of course that's absurd but a lot of people in wine uh, you know all 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 the old guard um whether Ah, Stephen Spurrier, who just passed away. Yeah, who wow. Was, wow. Uh, who was a very good family friend and at the house very often. Um, but all of them, Hugh Johnson, Broadbent, um, Chelichev was amazing, who, you know, was the legendary winemaker for BV. Um, he was so moving. And I, you know, I remember dinners um, where all the Burgundians would come and just drink up what he had to say because he was just a very humble emotional i mean he had very strong opinions but um he he was an inspiration um a, a lot of them, the american wineries of of that time whether um zelma long of course the whole gang in oregon the letts and ponzi's and adel signs and you know the the beginning of the very serious wine there um um and pretty much every writer um, and great chefs. We were very good friends with the Twagro brothers. Richard only came by the house, and I remember him taking me in the garden and explaining, you know, how to pick the um, Yeah, 
was it was it, it was a house that drew people that were interested in wine, and then of course the people that just liked it that were not necessarily in the trade. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that with us. So, um, <clears throat> you're in LA and, um, nobody's liking Burgundy, but like, what was your, like when you first, uh, got a job in the wine business, like what, what was that first job? Was it, were you like front of the house back of that? What, what was your first gig? Actually? No, oh, I was a, I was a stock boy. I, I swept floors. I had a little apron on. I learned how to gift wrap. Um, I learned how that, you know, that was blue was for Hanukkah and green and red was for Christmas. Um, I can still wrap a case of wine, like, uh, making a, a, you know, a bed in the army. Um, <laughs> I, I stocked the cold box. Occasionally I was dragged out of the back. It was a, it was, um, a store in Los Angeles's Valley, which, you know, will mean something to people who know Los Angeles and it's called the Duke of Bourbon. And they basically sold California wine, but he knew who my mother was. So occasionally he'd trot me out, you know, from the back. I know your saying, mom was, go sweep the floor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, well, that was it. He'd, he'd, he'd trot me out from the back and, and say, this is the son of Becky Wasserman. Of course, he was introducing me to a California Cabernet collector who would just, <laughs> you know, look me up and down and not even understand what the Duke was saying. So I felt put on display and I was I was much happier with my glue gun in the back. <laughs> Um, then I went into retail in Beverly Hills, that, you know, place that had a few celebrities. And then I, I left that. And for a long time, I was the sales rep. You know, I did, uh, I worked, uh, you know, one of the great things I worked for Rudy Vist for two years and that really cemented my love of Riesling and German wines. I worked for some of my mom's importers. I worked for, you know, I, I sold geeky wine around LA for a long time as a sales rep. And then I was hired by... Woodland Hills Wine Company to um, become their French, German, and Austrian buyer. And that was awesome. It was, at the time, I think one of the greatest stores in the country. Um, without a doubt, we, um, I was left to do whatever I wanted as far as purchasing. Um, and, you know, we imme I immediately started bringing in, because they were pretty score-driven when I walked in. Yep, yep. Um, but I was allowed to, you know, if it's sold, they said, go ahead. So we did a lot of, we did a huge, we were, it was basically one of the in top three Burgundy stores in the country. We did amazing with Northern Italian, California, um, Germany, Austria. It was, it was very geeky. It was just before, you know, all the regional wines became popular again in great part, thanks to the natural wine movement. Um, but we did the Loire. The Jura was nothing then. Um, I remember bringing in six bottles of Vin Jaune from Poufnay and hearing about it for a year from the store owners because it wouldn't sell. <laughs> but it was a great. It was a great time. We still could get you know early nineteenth century Madeiras for you know maybe a hundred and fifty wholesale. We we could taste everything in, in the O one vintage. You know, normal people like me as a retail salesperson, another friend of mine who worked there, and some some of our customers that were normal, not like the big whales, but normal people really loved the stuff. We would go out every week and would line up 12 bottles, but everything we wanted from Burgundy, Meunier Moussigny was 150 bucks, Rousseau Claude de Bez was 150 bucks. Um, six of us, we could share these wines. I mean, occasionally we'd throw in Latash or something. Mm -hmm. It was... It was a, a crazy, really, really good time to learn, taste your way around, you know, Germany and Piedmont and Austria and Burgundy and the Rhone and Grower Champagne. I was I was a big Terry Tees fan uh, in those days, both for all three of the things he did, um, Champagne, Austrian and German. Um, it was right before the slightly geekier low dosage things came out. Yeah. Uh, but we could also fine wine wasn't selling super well. I remember cleaning out um, a big distributor from all their salon eighty eight and ninety because it was just sitting there. Nobody could sell it. Um, and I was stacked on the floor cases of eighty eight, which I absolutely was probably one of my favorite champagne vintages. For not a lot of money, I think it was it was, it was under hundred bucks, maybe. 90 bucks and there was stacks of it 
you could I in 01 I had stacks of Fourier and Barteau from Rosenthal. I mean, it was still at a time where you not many people were that interested and you could get a lot of wine, you know. So it was fun. It was great. It was a great time. Yeah, sounds as if. I mean, that's <clears throat> bananas. Um I always remember Salon Champagne. There was a movie with John Cusack in the eighties where he drops out of college, he becomes like a political operative. And like he had a case of salon, and I was like, I gotta have that champagne. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm. Well, that that was good taste. Yeah. What? What? Um. See if you could find that, Lonnie. Uh, Kuzak movie, political operative. Um, just trying to remember, but uh, yeah, that was that's, and I was not even into wine then. I think that was like late '80s, early '90s. That movie came out, but I was like, I was like, well, that must be really good stuff. It's in a John Kuzak movie. Like, right, that that would mean it would have to be great champagne, but turns out it really is. And it's just funny, like you said, how um, you said floor stacks, like people couldn't sell it. And nope. you, and and, and um, you know what? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to pause right there. We're going to take a quick break and then I'm going to come back and I want to unpack that with you. Why you think these wines were selling. So we're going to take a quick break, everybody, and we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. So we were talking about floor stacks of Salon, 88 and 90. Um, why do you think it was so hard um, to get people to try? I mean, objectively, and like you said, you were, you, were in, you were into Rieslings and Gruners and other grower champagnes. Like, why was it so hard to get people to try these wines? Why was it so hard to move them in the market? It was dominated by the press. So um, I think... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very simple answer. It was dominated by the press, and um, the press wasn't, you know, they they weren't looking at wines like that, even Salon back in the days, and or they weren't making champagne fun and popular. They didn't like Burgundy. Um, they liked, you know, the modern Piedmont wines, not the classics, so... They didn't like Rinaldi. They didn't like Mascarello. They didn't like. Um, they didn't like Jacosia Brown Label, but um, it was. And so, but it was really good for us. The few, the few stores around the country that said, you know, screw it, we're going to do what we want and what we believe in. Um, it was great because all these wines were available. And we, you know, we 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 turned people onto old school Piedmont, or um, and you know, just a, a huge array of Burgundy, and it it was, you know, they took interest in Germany every twenty years. So when O one came out, that actually that was a huge. Um, we sold a lot of German wine, so we, I mean, we have to thank them sometimes. So what happened in the case of Burgundy and Champagne is that specialist reviewers finally came out and um, to support it. In our case, it was, in Burgundy's case, it was um, Alan Meadows. Okay. And actually, Alan Meadows happened to live in the same, um, um, in the same neighborhood as the, the Woodland Hills Wine Company was in. So we we used to do all of our, we used to put on tastings, educational tastings on Burgundy. And, you know, there was a, there was a great synergy there because, um, but he, he was very instrumental in, in, in helping Burgundy sales. There was somebody who took it seriously, who reviewed it widely. It wasn't a footnote, um, in, you know, in, um, in a newsletter. So it helped a lot. It was also the beginning of wine searcher. So if you had the right wine, at a decent price, people would find you. Yeah, I do. I do. I don't have a pro, but I do enjoy Wine Searcher. You know, because mm -hmm. someone can throw out a wine, and you know, um, that is that is some good that has come from the internet. Um, uh, <clears throat> but uh, so so um, you're still at Woodland Hills, right? So how long were you at Woodland Hills total? Ninety. Mm, it was 99 through 2000 and early 2005, I think. Okay. So like five, six years, five, six years. Okay. And, and then where'd you go to next after the Will and Hills wine company? Hmm. Well, so there's the Rudy story. Oh, right. So, Cause that, that would be, um, 
That would okay. All right. Yeah, that would be around that time. Sure. Yeah. So Rudy, I mean, the first time I saw Rudy, he was just this. I mean, he looked underage. He walks in the store and everybody's falling on him because, you know, he dropped a little money and I didn't pay attention to him because I mean, I noticed him. I didn't pay attention to him because he was really into California cabs and Australian, you know, 100 point wines and the big, and big, from, big fruit bombs like yep, Astralis yep. and all that, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's what he was drinking, and then a few months later, he um, he um, he shows up in a in a Burgundy uh, tasting group, invited by someone, and um, and he's very he's very nice, he's very shy, and he's actually making really pertinent comments about wine, like more pertinent than a lot of the other people that were there, and. Um, so I liked him because of that, and we we you know became phone buddies. And he uh, a few months later he's calling me up asking me about you know normal stuff, um, you know vintage of D vintages of DRC like in the nineties and the eighties, nothing crazy. And um, and then suddenly he's showing up with bottles from the 40s the 30s and um you know the whole rudy thing begins um but at some point woodland hills was a family-run company and the you know I, I i need to do something else so i was looking for investors to start a store mm -hmm. and uh rudy stepped up so i did open a store for rudy um, it took a while, um, and as soon as we opened, um, um, it, well, the shit hit the fan. Uh, it was the Ponceau thing. We opened in, I think, early 2008. Okay. And then the Ponceau thing happened. There was then there was structural um, structural issues at the store, and um, it was a mess. He he didn't finance it properly. Um, it was basically a big storage facility, it, it, and there were there were beautiful architectural plans. It was supposed to be this very ambitious, gorgeous tasting room. It was it really it it, it was an old, beautiful old Art Deco uh, building. But things started to go south, and um, and basically I didn't see him very much, and I stuck around for about a year and a half because he had bought the business, he had put a little money into it, but not enough to make it survive. And then I just left um a year before he got arrested i think um and uh but he was i mean you know he's obviously a complex human being but um he was generous he was funny mm -hmm. he was an absolutely brilliant taster um really really gifted um i don't know what do you want to know no i mean because i think i think uh, you know a lot of people <laughs> just um see that movie sour grapes and just think um how could these people be taken i mean but like you grew up around this stuff i mean like you said this guy went into high level groups and like you, you said he's making pertinent comments i mean he obviously did have a love he, for wine and and a, some knowledge correct he was you know he had a lot of knowledge uh, but that's easy to acquire. What's not that easy to acquire is a brilliant palate. And he was truly a, a great taster. I, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, some, some, some psalms that are known to taste blind really well. Rudy was amazing. He could do the pony tricks like, you know, no one else. Um, but, um, and he was really into wine. In the beginning, I'd drag him to German truck and baron house laser tastings. I mean, he wasn't messing around. He'd come. Um, and I don't know when the, the whole fraud thing started or, but at, that wasn't the original Rudy. The original Rudy was just a total wine nut with the means to, and we tasted extraordinary things. And of course, a lot of fake wine as well. Some of it, some of which we noticed and some of which we didn't. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I think it was, you know, in the beginning it was very much a catch me if you can kind of story. Okay. Uh, he was really passionate even about what he was creating. Um, and he'd buy old wine to create um, these things. And what he was always very, what he was always very respectful of was the character of the vintage. 
I think that's that's the way that he busts down the. That's the way he conned some of the more knowledgeable people. Is that mm-hmm. there was always um, in his fakes a um, a respect. There was a respect of something there, and it, it, in general, with him, it was the vintage. Um, and so you know, if you sixty two is an insane vintage in 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 Burgundy. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but if you put a great 62 in a bottle as a base wine and then tell people it's so and so, I mean, 62 is, you know, it's very, very special. So if you get that 62, if you get the essence of, of 62 in the bottle, you're like, oh, yes, right? It's like it had you're, enough. You're, you're, you're 75% of the way there and believing, and your brain will do, you know, the last 25%, which it probably shouldn't, but that's easy to say in retrospect, you know? Right, right. Um, um, anyway, he, I mean, you know, he is a con, and con people are, are clever, and uh, he was good. I think he was very passionate about it. I think he was even passionate about his fakes. Um, but, like... Other people, too, I mean, you know, I'm, with confinement, I'm watching a lot of, you know, true crime on Netflix, and I saw this guy doing, you know, fake Mormon um, history papers. I mean, amazing. It, it reminded me of Rudy, and then there was this other person doing fake forgeries for art. I saw a lot of, you know, art forgeries the other day. I mean, they're... they're I think I saw that with my wife. It was, it was out in Queens. Yeah, that was a huge one. Yeah. Yeah. They were they were in love they were in love with their their subject. They were true true fans. I think by the time so we we didn't by the time he opened the store we weren't friends anymore. Um, so I as much as I knew him well and I was you know running a store that belonged to him we didn't talk very much and um, I wasn't even at the Pulso dinner in Los Angeles even though it was literally five minutes away from the store he didn't invite me to that. Uh, the store was a money pit and never made money. Um, I mean, you know, everything was investigated by the FBI and things like that. I mean, it's um, it 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 never it never sold. You know, what auction houses sold? It wasn't that kind of a place. It was a storage facility with a neighborhood geeky wine store, basically. Gotcha. But, yeah, I mean, he's. Uh, He's an interesting character for sure. I mean, uh, it sounds as if, I mean, I just, it's, yeah, I think, I think, um, and people don't know, uh, you know, when say you hear con man, it actually, the original, it's confidence man. So they gain your confidence, yeah. right? They, they gain people's confidence yeah. and that's how they're able to do it. So like somebody said, like, you know, he, he knew enough about a vintage to put enough in the bottle and then, you know, and, and like you said, like our brain, I forgot what it's called. Cause I'm not a psychologist, but our brain wants to be right. So it's going to, it's going to link up and go, Oh yeah, you know, uh, that did happen in 62 and Oh, look at the cork. And so you, you find reasons for it to, to be okay. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, in my case, suspension of disbelief, it was the recession. I, 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 you know, had wanted my, you know, a project that I was running for a long time, but there, there were signs in retrospect that I should have, um, seen as far as you know the 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 cleanliness of the labels bugged me Mm -hmm. but on the other hand a lot of what he forged was from the french wine merchant nicolas and i asked somebody i trusted in in the wine trade in france said why are you know are these and he said yeah the sellers nicolas are very dry so the labels will be clean so you get that confirmation from the outside you think i i felt bad when i so the store was under finance so we 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 um, so I had time on my hands, so I started really delving into everything that was being said, and I found some hilarious things. Um, but I also can never find some of the bottles he sold, mm-hmm. and it's, especially in Bordeaux. And that I I poured over auction catalogs, and I'm like, okay, there is no, there really isn't no, uh, there 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 is no Pomerol from you know, the forties, there's no, there's no Petrus from the forties in mags. I, I looked at every catalog and that's the, you know, I could find some older Rumiers. I could, I could find plenty of old Russo, old DRC that existed in auction catalogs or in old retail catalogs from Draper and Esquim. I, the, the Bordeaux just weren't there. The, the right bank Bordeaux weren't there. And then 
it's not that I believed he was a faker. I just went, okay, this is not sitting right with me. So I, that, that was, and I kind of had figured out also on my own kind of who he was. And that's when I kind of left. I, uh, I'd made the connection to the banking um, scandal in Indonesia, okay. um, which is which is interesting because, you know, everybody thinks this is a a fake wine story, but I mean, I I would assume it's a money laundering story. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill Coke, I, I, if my memory serves me correct, in the big Acker auction of two thousand and six, I think bought three million dollars worth of wine. He proved, and he had a, everybody looking at. It, I think that about three hundred thousand worth was fake. So that's ten percent. Yeah. Um, which, if you take that as a data point, you know, um, maybe it was more about money laundering than it was about fake wine. Wow, that could make sense because I mean, what I mean, what's the what's the percentage run on corked bottles? Do you know? Um. It's getting lower. It's you, sometimes you hear about two percent. Yeah. Sometimes you hear five, but it's somewhere around there. Right. You know. So I mean, it's it's not it's not out of whack. Yeah. And that knowing you know after seeing knowing the family history with the bank and they it it seems like um, it's a good good supposition. You are a very smart man. Very learned man, at least very think a uh, thinking man. Um, so, how was what was your actual exit? Um, did did were you there? Did the FBI raid the store and you were there, or no, had you exited um, beforehand? No, it was, <laughs> no. Um, I had left in fully. I, I I went down to one day a week in 2010 because I'd hired another guy and I wanted to have him to have one day off. So I I just went in on I think Sundays and just um, manned the store. It was a, you know it was a two person operation and then in 11 i i left and i'm um in i think 2012 winter of 2012 just before you got arrested i i have a friend of mine that calls me from the u.s and he says the fbi wants to talk to you which is never a, a <laughs> it's phone not call, call you don't want to get <laughs> you're happy to get and you know my stomach I kind of sank in my heels and um and i got back to los angeles and i I, I called the the agent in question and you know about two weeks later he, he said yeah, I'd like to talk to you and um and uh, I went to the federal building and it you know they they it very it was total movie um you know they could have been cast out of a a cop central casting thing. yeah <laughs> yeah um, he was very tall very well dressed very handsome very sharp she was she was also. She was a Latina woman. She was they're super sharp, super polite, super, you know, they don't let anything through. They're very nice. Right. Um, and they just asked questions and I, you know, told them everything they wanted to know about the store, which was basically, you know, um, I think there were two sales that went through the store that could have been on those kinds of lines, and they were tiny compared to what, you know, was being brandished. So I told them about that and I mean, I literally stood, it was like an hour interview, maybe a longer, and I just literally stood there and said, I think you have the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> three, three weeks later, boom. Um, yeah, I was in disbelief. You know, I, I, I saw some fakes, not all of them. I mean, I'm sure he calm, you know, there are a lot of wines I believed in that weren't real. But um, I always thought he had, he had been taken, not that he was pr- producing them. Um, and, um, there you go. But I mean, you know, in the last two or three years, I hardly saw him yeah, um, in yeah. the beginning I did and went to the dinners and things like that. It was fun. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, man, thanks for uh, being willing to talk about that. So then what was your, so that was like I said, 2012, we got to, so then it was just time to go back to Burgundy. What happened? What what made you like? You're like let me love... let me get out of here. What's the extradition treaty between no, France? And no, like, no, no, no. no, I mean you know the, I mean honestly the you know the 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 government looked at every bit. No, of I I believe you. Yeah, and, and there was nothing, there was nothing there. It lost money. It was not a a front for Rudy, and there was no doubt or question about that. Um, you know, it, it was it was it was almost giving him money rather than you know. Um, no, actually, he was putting he was putting a ton of money into it. He was losing money. I didn't even understand it. Anyway, um, I really loved retail. 
I okay. loved retail because it allowed me to deal with, you know. And I want to agree with you. People, retail is one of the best places to be in the wine business because you actually get to talk to the consumer, the real consumer, you know, and and you, you do get to enter and you do get to interact with the sales reps and then they bring around, you know, the producers, but like you are, you are, you're, your ear is to the pulse of the ground when you do retail. I love retail. Yeah. I love retail. I was very happy in retail. I, I got to discover and get good at, you know, every region I chose to become, you know, involved in. And, um, I like to curate, for my my customers and 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 things like that, and I had you know opinions, and I was really curating, and um, it was hard for me to to decide. So I was I I briefly thought, I mean I did other things. I published an out of print book. I um. I What's the name of your out of print book? We can let's revive it. Let's 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 look, like make people pay like five hundred dollars on eBay for it. <laughs> no, it's called Bouquet. Um, it's written by a, a wonderful woman called G.B. Stern, and it's a hilarious book written in 1927 um, about a tour of um, France with two couples. One of them likes Bordeaux. One of them likes Burgundy. They bicker all the time about what's better. There's a beautiful feminist rant in it in Sauterne. She's, she was a My producer very, wants the movie rights. <laughs> she, she was a very, very gifted writer. Uh, she was a friend of Noel Coward. She was a playwright. She was... And it was, it's just a lovely book. We, we produced, um, a friend of mine called Karen Cease and I just reprinted, um, a, a, a pretty version. It's got a silk screens cover cover. We hired an illustrator it was printed in the U S not, um, not elsewhere on nice paper. And I think anyway, I did that. We, um, and then I was, um, starting to, uh, you know, work part-time for the family company. And then I realized that I could bring something to the family company, which was basically their their switch into other regions because Burgundy was starting to climb. I'd gone from a store that was, you know, had a 10,000 square foot um, Woodland Hills Wine Company that had a 10,000 square foot footprint full of wine, mm -hmm. where Wasserman was a big part of what I did to a smaller neighborhood store where most of the 10,000 square feet was storage. And... I realized that our family company was not that useful to me um, because I needed Loire, I needed, you know, I needed other kinds of wines, and my shelf space was limited for the for the more collectible wines, and and that was the um, that was what I thought I could bring. I had to ask permission. It's not like I walked back in. There was a team in place, mm -hmm. uh, um, so I said, "Can I please come home? I think I can." I think I can do something that would be interesting. And and let and, me I'm gonna stop for a second because I, I think so many people now in this world, like in the social media world and 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 with the rise of the Psalm movies and people, you know, you are a Burgundy expert. Do you have any Wisset or any other any type of degrees that say you're a Burgundy expert? But I clearly you're a Burgundy expert. Do you have any pieces of paper that say that? No. Right. I try. I tried. In two thousand and one I signed up for um the Master of Wine and um, went up to the, um, whatever the, the first meeting in Napa and, um, and I forget who it was. They, they kept on repeating through, through the introductory course or whatever it was that to remember that they were not masters of fine wine. They were masters of wine. And, um, it made me think so. I I decided at some point that I wanted to become a geek. I didn't want to know about every wine in the world. There were regions that did not interest me. The economics, you know, how many cases of yellowtail was moving around. It was not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. At that time, I wasn't into studying farming or winemaking that much. I was about tasting. I was about forming my opinion of wine regions. I was, a you know... Um, and not, you know, not just high-end wine, but I, I, I love, you know, brilliant um, wines of any, any class. But, but I'm, I've got a palate that's, you know, European, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, tends to be Northern European. Um, so I don't want to know about everything. So I decided to become a specialist. I wrote a couple essays for MW and decided it wasn't for me. Um, I don't regret not pursuing it and probably would have failed because... It requires an astounding amount of discipline and 
I'm not sure I have that. <laughs> what, 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 what year were you born? 68? 66. 66, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Six. yeah as, as 60s kids, we don't have a lot of that. I don't know why. Nope. <laughs> nope. nope. Um, nope. So, yeah, so I, you know, I, I asked permission to come back and to the family company and do my thing, which was, you know, we, we need other wines. And um, they said, yeah. And um, I was living in L.A., and um, so I, it was natural for me to take care of the West Coast, so I did that. And um, started scouring France for other domains, and I, that's, the, that's the dream job to me. Um, um, honestly, driving, driving in France, listening to podcasts or jazz or whatever kind of music, um, in the middle of nowhere and going to see somebody for the first time and you know the thief goes into the barrel and that's the moment of truth and you're alone and i mean often i'm alone and you're alone and you're gonna like and you've heard about the person you've never tasted the wines maybe maybe you have maybe you already know but sometimes you don't and um the thief goes into the barrel and that's the moment of truth you know it's you the wine whatever impression you have of the people. And though I was annoyed at first not to be in the retail thing because I could do whatever wine I wanted. If right. I wanted to work with that producer, I could. Right. If I wanted to work with this other producer, I could. So it was a little annoying at first, but I realized that we're, we're getting married with the producers. Like this is, we're, we're in for the long term. It's a very noble I mean, we're in, and it's going to be complicated. There's going to be ups and downs. Um, I, I've, you know, it's a big responsibility. Um, it's not, um, um, it's not parasitic. You know, we're not, we're not getting the greatest score at the lowest price, or always trying to sell the most Instagrammable wine. We're not going after those things. We're going mm. after true representations of you know, and and people. And 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 if we're going to do it, we're going to do it for hopefully. You know, some of the growers have been in the book for over forty years now. Um, that's, um, it's pretty amazing when you come to think about it. You know, that is more than most marriages actually. So yeah, when you when you say we're we're marrying people, it's we're talking old school. Talk like my parents' generation. My parents were married for fifty-one years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, it's it's a true. So I I love that, and um, I love being alone in the middle of nowhere. And um, well, I don't love being alone, but uh, you know, I I I I do love. You enjoy yeah. solitude. You enjoy meditative moments of quiet. I enjoy, you know. Bring these far away from the other regions. So it's in the car. I, you know, I have my, I have my podcast. I have my, but I just love that moment where you don't know you've never tasted. You kind of trust what you're about to taste because you know we're not taking wild guesses here. They're kind of sort of curated the guess the guesses themselves and just that moment when the when the thief goes into the barrel, you're poured the first wine in the glass, and you know it's either the beginning of. Uh, a long story or, um, or, 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 or <laughs> slightly uncomfortable exit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have a friend like call me and at six Oh five in case the wine sucks. <laughs> it's like the, the bailout on the date, right? <laughs> yeah. But mostly by now we kind of know what we're stepping into. Yeah. Um, I have to figure people are like, you have a network of people like you need to meet Paul or et cetera. So, and so, you know, like, you know, yeah, a lot of it's coming from other winemakers now. But um, you'd be amazed that, I mean, the, I the commerce of wine has a bad rap. Um, but you know the the but true curating is really what we do. I mean, the passionate ones we actually curate, and there's a vision, there's a taste, there's a. Um, there's some principles we want, um, and um, I, th I think I think it's noble noble calling, you know. And I I don't think the press does curate as well. I think they have to fill their newsletters or pages with a lot of 
this is great. Um, otherwise, you know, why, you know, why, why buy a subscription? Uh, you know, 150 bucks for subscription if uh, you're only going to learn about three domains every year. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I think it's a fascinating job and it's a complicated job and we get married and we represent and, you know, of course, once something's famous um, is great, but, it, you know, it, it can be a long, it took us 20 years or it took him 20 years, not us 20 years. For Fred Mounier in Chambon Musigny to become a, a mega star. So that's, yeah. you know. I've once heard it takes at least 10 years to become an overnight success. And mm. that's so true. So um, is there anything right now? Because, um, you, you know, I love what you said. And I just have to say, it, like, I, I, I want to go back to, like, you know, your Becky Washington son, and they go, yeah, okay, go in the back and sweep up and stock shelves, and I'll parade you out to, the, yeah, to the, exactly. you know. And then even when you came back to your mother's company, it was, you like almost had an interview like, hey. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, the, um, <laughs> the willingness to put in the work. Is there a region now, like, says you're expanding the portfolio, is there, is there a region you're expanding? Like we like we started with the uh, the Cote de Catalan, the Roussillon. Is there a region yeah. that you're really excited about right now? I don't have much, but I love Savoie wines. Um, Mondeuse, I think, is an insanely beautiful red grape. Um, I love the whites of the Roussillon. I do love the reds too. The Southwest is 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 the treasure trove of unusual rare variety i think the southwest if i had to pick one today because it's both white and red um the variety is incredible so it goes you know all the way from for us Jurançon, all the way to fronton so that whole you know bit of land that's just north of the pyrenees mountain until you reach you know the other side which is not referred to as the southwest Caor, um malbec can be such um beautiful very fresh uh, expression of red wine on Kimmeridgian, which is the same soil as Chablis. So it's kind of a little confusing because you've got these red wines on white wine soil and they used to be black and tannic, but now they're anything but. Um, we work with a, a wonderful domain there um, called Calmet, um, low sulfur. I mean, just beautiful farming. Jurançon, which, you know, is kind of, uh, I mean, it's very similar to Chena. It can be, it's super aggressive, acidic, almost tannic. It's it's a wine with a huge amount of personality. Fronton, such values, crazy, bi-dynamic wines, um, in, you know, rare varieties for no money whatsoever. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm liking the Southwest a lot. Um, and I'm liking, I mean, you know, there's no point talking about the Jura, even though, of course, it's magnificent. And, um, but also other, you know, price of wine is a problem, but it doesn't mean you you drink poorly for not a lot. I mean, everybody has, you know, Côte de Nuit envy in Burgundy, but honestly, the 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 young kids making incredible wines from, not the young kids, the, the, the newer domains, newer people, some often outsiders making wines from modest regions. They're hungry. And you see that hunger in the wines. Mm -hmm. Like the, a lot of the other wines, you know, they're from prestigious appellations, very, very desirable, but they're comfortable and they taste comfortable. Complacency so really, is a word that comes to mind. Yeah. They taste, yeah. You know, they tick all the boxes, but I think... I believe I can taste hunger and energy in wine and, and, you know, this is not news, but when you see Olivier Lamy in Saint-Aubin, what he's doing is insane or Sion Patay in Marcenay or Chantreve, uh, David Croix in Bone, which is the most frowned upon, you know, um, uh, Thomas Boulet in Volnay. I mean, we're just, um, I, I, I mean, bare tone. I mean, there's just this hunger in the modest appellations, and I think it trumps the 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 greatness of the terroir. To me, to 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 feel that energy, that hunger in the wines, um, is what I want. Um, and it doesn't have to be a Grand Cru from the Côte d'Ivoire, honestly. And I'm not saying that, to, you know. 
No, I understand to, what you're saying, and I and I think people need to hear that because I think Burgundy for so long um, has seemed out of uh, reach for people, um, you know, for cost, you know, and uh, it's good to know that there is a a shift. There, the the, the times are a changing um, for sure, for sure. So. Um, let me ask you uh, one last question before we wrap up. Um, so you're you you mentioned you know your bass. You love jazz, bebop. What what's what is your ultimate uh, wine and jazz combination? Oh wait, wait, well, hold on. I'm gonna back up before you answer that. What was the bottle of wine? Like you grew up around all this amazing wine, but what, what yeah. was a bottle of wine that just like knocked your socks off when you were younger? That you were like, this wine stuff is the truth. Did you have a wine like that? I do. Like, so I I drank so many wines and tasted so many wines. You know, it's not like we were you were, were drinking. I mean, we you know. No, uh, I mean you weren't you weren't chugging uh, jugs uh, yeah, of yeah, Colorado, so right? The first wine I ever saw, and by seeing, I mean the first wine I actually decomposed like a professional taster's and started pulling apart elements. You know. Um, was actually not a Burgundy. It was um, Kermit had um, this wonderful old negociant de Loire called René Loyot. And um, he was one of those old school craftsmen, you know, just incredible. My mom tells incredible stories about them. And I used to go as a kid and she, there were a few bottles she kept from the Kermit era um, that she was very emotional about. And I knew this was one of them. And they had this beautiful Art Deco label, like archaic, you know, from the 20s label. And it was an early 70s um, Vouvray Moelle. And I, at some point, my mom said, yeah, I'll go. She always sent me to the cellar to pick stuff out for customers. I must have been 14, 13, 15, something along those lines. And um, I said, okay, it's time for this bottle that she... Um, mom's funny. They're, they're, they're wines that she'll never let us touch. And, you know, <laughs> for, for, for some growers, it kind of accumulates, like we're looking, we're staring at 40 cases. And we're like, mom, can we, can we, and, you know, <laughs> so, mom, come on, you just, just relax. You've got, you know, 500 bottles. We'll, we'll do this. But this, this one bottle of Vouvray, she just didn't want to, you know, do, and finally you know, I knew it must've been the right moment. I said, can we drink this? And it was a, I, I remember it was a Sunday and it was a lunch and it was, some customer was there and um, and we popped it and it first of all it wasn't Muela it was demi sec so it was okay. off dry okay. even though the label said otherwise and um, that trinity of sugar acidity and extracts just how clear it was how brilliant it was. You know, and you could literally tell every, I, you know, it's the first wine where I, was, I tasted as, a, as, um, I think I finally re realized I was actually tasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some, some, somewhere in my teens, I forget exactly when. Um, and that was it. That's when I started, you know, seeing wine rather than just, listening to people talk about it and just, before that it was a vague thing for me gotcha it's gotcha. a muddled impression I, I do want to mention one wine though because the greatest wine I ever had was um and you know maybe it's a good parting note because it was a rudy bottle and um rudy sometimes did great things that were really not commercial and he he, he did a tasting of very old bouchard's had the wine shipped in directly for, from Bouchard for um, a good part of them, so they were unquestionable. And there were four 19th century wines in the tasting, and um, one of them was 1865 Volnay Saint-Nau from Bouchard. And it was my I'd heard about pre phylloxera wines growing up because it was still a big subject of conversation back yep, then. Yep. And it lived up to everything I had ever dreamed about. That was probably the from Pastera. Um, pre phylloxera wines are gone, or they're not alive, or there are very few of them. Everybody claimed they were better because they were from ungrafted vines and got to listen. I, you know, I've, 
I've seen three or four in my life that were just absolutely insane. And that one. So wow. in the middle of all his, you know, badness, he was capable of these rather insane moments. Wow. Wow. Wow, 1865, oh man. So um, that's in, that's just that's ludicrous. That's just ludicrous. Um, so uh, if Paul Wasserman's having a, uh, a, 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 a a wine and jazz night, what what are you doing, man? Wine and jazz. I like I like burgundy with jazz. I mean, I, I, I listen to a lot of music. I listen to electronic music a lot. I listen to all kinds of music. But um, if we're going to talk, you know, acoustic jazz, you know, 60s, 50s, 40s, um, there's little doubt in my mind that it's burgundy. Um, there's this bareness. There's this, um, um, you know, this acoustic it's not electric, you know, electric power, you'd have to go somewhere else. And this kind of purity that goes with acoustic instruments, um, I'm very happy with the thought of red burgundy and, 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 and bebop. Uh, because at the same time, when they're young, they're not the most giving wines on the planet. They're, they've got a little hardness. They need to age. You need to know what you're doing. Um, at least in the past years that's changing so i think bebop goes with red burgundy without a doubt well, that might be the title bebop and Bur i had another title but I, I don't know bebop and burgundy now my i don't know the first one i don't know. we'll think about it oh my god oh paul oh man thank you for doing this um we, we connected last year actually in 2020 and um uh, just glad we were able to do this i i hope that um uh, when you come stateside, uh, we can actually drink a bottle or two or this is some bebop. Yeah, but... uh, or if I get over there, I, I did apply for the Becky Washington scholarship, but I didn't really do a good job, so I didn't get selected. But if I come over there, man, I want to come hang out. Uh, have, you, have you take me around. I'm so sorry. It was, it was, it was torturous please know this no i believe it but like i like i literally could have sent in like my real i was just like hey my name's marvin you know, blah, blah, blah i got a, you know, i got a podcast <laughs> like I, I i could have said a whole thing you'd have been blown away oh i'm such an underachiever <laughs> it was torturous we had a hundred and it, it like taught us a lot about how to do this again um that's a know. great program though uh, that uh that that your family is doing there um so, um, uh, but literally you're just so interesting. I love what I love about wine is like, like th there's so many intelligent people who are in wine and just the stories and, you know, and, and you know, w like we get together, it would have been a different conversation, but this was a great conversation. And like, like I said, we like to get outside of this and we could just go on rants and talk about Diz and all that stuff, you know, but for right now, um, tell people where they can find you and how they can be a part of what you're doing. Well, they can follow me or Becky Wasserman .co on Instagram. Um, they certainly can seek out the wines um, around the country. Um, that's about it. Um, yeah, I'm going to plug someone because she's an extension of the family. Her name's Icy Lou. And if you're if um, she works for us uh, part time, but she also has a podcast on the side. It's called Ungrafted. And we're going to have and her on because she hooked us up. I'm going to have yes. her on. Yes, and she she focuses on all the the farming, the technical aspects, yeah. but in a in a really, you know, she's you know organic, regenerative, human aspect. So if you want to delve deeper into that, and it's not our producers, but she is a part of the team, and she's a big force in in how we think and pushing us to do the right thing. So that's a you know a good way to stay in touch with us and um, follow the winemakers, man. That's they're 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 interesting people. They don't necessarily fit the cookie cutter. Oh, this is natural. Oh, this is expensive burgundy. There. Buy the wines. Taste the wines. There it Eat. is. That's what it's about. Buy the wine. Taste wine. Buy wine. That's how you develop your palate. Drink wine. Um, 
Okay, Go everybody. Um, my God, Paul B. Wasserman, thank you so much for being a part of the Black Wine Guy experience. You are definitely a friend of the show. We're going to have to come you back in a, in a later episode, and, and it'll either be in studio here or in Burgundy. We'll get my ass over there, get on a plane, get it done. I'm vaccinated. I'm ready to go. Um, I got the first vaccine today. Oh, congratulations, man. That's Which awesome. Which is why I'm, I'm actually slightly under the weather. It did knock me out of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, the, that's the French version. <laughs> I, just, yeah, I, I just had to do that. I'm American. You got to do the French joke. Okay, everybody. <laughs> just want to thank Paul B. Wasserman. Until the next time, here's to the uh, philosophers, the mavericks, the deep thinkers, and to all the wine drinkers. Cheers. Cheers, guys and ladies and everyone. Thank you.